Hello, I hope you're all doing well. So this webinar will be focusing on strength training for Quidditch. By the time I finish, I want to have given uh, information on both the general and Quidditch specific benefits of strength training, and also have given practical tips on starting up for beginners. Uh, the reason I think this will be a useful topic is because we see more and more discussions and development of resources for the sport in many areas, but there seems to be a gap in knowledge sharing when it comes to some of the physical aspects of the game, uh, which as a physical context sport shouldn't really be the case. Um, so for those looking for ways to develop their physical capabilities, I hope to provide some departure points for more investigations, as well as some practical information that people can incorporate into their training. Uh, so let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rudy, and if at any point you think of any questions that you want to ask, uh, you can find me on Facebook as Rudy OA. Uh, feel free to drop me a message. Uh, there's so much more that I could share on these topics, so I'm happy to follow up on what I couldn't squeeze in. Um, so if you don't know me, this is me in the black t-shirt on the back row, and this is when I first started playing. Uh, you can tell it's 2014 by how cool we look. And then fast forward uh, some years through a few different teams, and now I play for the London Unspeakables, uh, London's favourite team. You can find us on Facebook if you like memes. Um, I also put out content on social media around strength training and Quidditch. So if that interests you, you can find more information at Lift Team 6. Uh, throughout this time, Quidditch has taken up more of my life than I could have imagined from starting in that small, muddy field. Um, but in reality, the sport of powerlifting has uh, always been my primary passion. I'm a competitive powerlifter. And I've also helped other lifters and Quidditch players on their own strength training. Um, and blending what I've seen and read from both of these worlds is the reason why I'm excited to give this presentation. And today I'll be showing you some of the practices that can help you become a better athlete. Uh, so this is why I hope you listen to what I have to say. Um, but in addition to my points, I've gathered the work from several researchers and other people of interest that you can learn from. And throughout the webinar, we'll be adding uh, them to a document which I believe you already have access to. Um, and I'll also link the social media page, Lift Team 6, where you can find articles on these topics and information on a Quidditch specific long piece form that I'll be releasing shortly. Um, so let's start by framing the discussion and looking at different ways in which you can improve as a player. And I'll later come on to why you should care about strength training. Um, there are many different aspects to consider if we want to holistically look at how we can get better at sport. Um, all of the different areas are as important as each other. And you'll commonly find that the best players are proficient in all of these areas. It doesn't really matter what your level is in these areas what matters is how much you're able to improve uh, we all have different baselines but what we should measure ourselves on is our progression uh, the first thing to say is that not everybody wants to improve and that's completely fine there are plenty of players that are invested for the socializing aspects of the sport particularly in our community um, and they may not have performance related interests uh, people play sports for a, a whole host of recent reasons. I, for example, uh, love going to the beach and swimming. I swim all day, but I, I don't have a, an interest in investing time to become a better swimmer. Um, so for people who want to improve their game, um, no matter what your current baseline is, these slides should be useful. Uh, I've summarized the performance metrics that you can see here to outline the variety of ways that analysts define uh, performance pillars and how you can get better as a player. So technical skill refers to learning and practicing the fundamentals of the game. For example, knowing the release point for a particular throw or practicing catching technique, uh, the fundamental movements specific to the sport. Um, top right is tactical awareness. So that could be getting a, a better understanding of a compact defense or a cavalry wall, 
or knowing when to time your beat or cut into the hoops. Um, you can also include gameplay experience here, which is vital. Um, next is mental prowess. So specifically improving your concentration, um, emotional control, motivation, self-confidence, your mindset, uh, the things that will set you apart at, at match point or in overtime. Um, the bottom right pillar is what we'll focus on in this webinar. Um, so developing your physical capacity or how well you can convert what's in your head to what you want to do on the field, whether you're looking to throw uh, further or jump higher or just be less easy to knock down. Um, of the four, this is the most objectively measurable and scalable. And I want to help show people today that anyone can work on physical development. It doesn't matter what your current baseline is. And also this can be done independently of your team. You can work on it in your own time in the gym or in a park or in your living room without needing 13 other bodies. Um, there's a, a level playing field of information. It doesn't matter how experienced your coach is or whether you benefit from inter-club or, or even intra-club um, knowledge and tactics sharing. There's a, a wealth of easily accessible information out there for you. And finally, it's, it's an area which uh, would benefit from more discussion in the community. We play a, a physical sport after all. Um, so moving forward with the physical development angle, there are many ways in which you can improve your level of physicality in the game. Again, all of which are important, but to do justice to the areas, uh, we're going to dive into just one today. Um, later in this section, I'll talk about what I think are the appropriate, um, let's say, ratios for a Quidditch player and what aspects are overemphasized. Um, we'll look at a rudimentary analysis of what actually goes on in a game from an energy profile perspective, um, but nonetheless, they're all very important. Um, today, we're defining these aspects, uh, firstly, as the endurance capacity that players need throughout the game, whether it's uh, aerobic fitness or muscular endurance, that being the ability to run and play for a set amount of time on pitch. Um, but also to be able to repeatedly put in high energy stints throughout the length of a match. Uh, we'll talk about the roles of each, um, given that we benefit from rolling substitutions. Um, speed here can encompass a player's ground running speed, but also agility, which is speed in response to a stimulus, i.e. running past an advancing defender. Or quickness, so how fast you can load your arm um, or get to a, a loose quaffle. Um, you can include reaction time in here as well. Um, mobility would be how well um, you can put your body through the ranges of motion that it needs to go through. Um, also the proprioceptive connection that you have with your body, which can tie into coordination. Uh, finally, we have strength training. So this is defined by uh, capacity for force development and also rate of force development and power. Um, Strength training is particularly important here as it's also the mechanism for improving almost all of the other aspects we're targeting. Um, so let's break down um, this basis for uh, strength training or resistance training. Um, yeah, so what is uh, strength training? What we're looking at today is um, resistance training and what it boils down to is basically uh, tricking your muscles into becoming stronger by using external loads or resistance to make them think that they need to adapt. It's a, a very basic biological principle that uh, we're able to manipulate for whatever our desired out outcomes are. And uh, to put it simply, our muscles are met by an external stress and in order to overcome them, they adapt. The way we can manipulate our muscle fibers to make positive adaptations is by progressively overloading them um, with more stimulus than they're currently dealing with. We can paint a picture of this with the myth of uh, Milo of Croton. Uh, so in sixth century BC, a legend has it that Milo as a young boy used to carry his calf up a hill every day uh, to market. And as the calf grew and got heavier over time, Milo's body adapted and grew stronger due to the this increase um, in external stress. And as the bull grew bigger, so did Milo. Um, if Milo had 
tried to carry the bull as a boy, he, he would have failed. And as a man lifting the calf, it would have been easy um, and wouldn't have provided a sufficient adaptation, which is the key thing to remember. Uh, Milo forced his muscles to do more work and they slowly adapted. Uh, that's what the body wants to do, um, adapt. Um, now, a bull is, is pretty heavy, so this myth might not be entirely true. Uh, and I advise you to seek advice from your doctor before uh, trying any physical activity. But the theory behind this story is biologically sound. Um, this is one of the prin uh, principal means for us to build a muscle or make myofibrillar hypertrophic gains. Um, the way in which our muscles grow is through uh, metabolic stress, mechanical tension, and muscle breakdown. Uh, for training, we're going to focus on the last two elements at a cellular level. Um, so as our muscle fibers are exposed to significant loads, um, there must be sufficient stress to cause growth. They start to get slightly damaged uh, through what we call myofibrillar tears. So that's the muscle breakdown. Um, after exercise, we rest and the muscles uh, start to try repairing themselves. Uh, they remember that they've struggled to handle the stimulus stimulus that they were exposed to last time and they try to build back bigger um, in case they have to uh, meet that same stress again. Um, to do this, they look to a process called uh, protein synthesis. Um, which recruits additional protein for uh, when it's time to repair the tears in the muscles. Um, protein that we eat is broken down by the body into amino acids. Uh, when we exercise, uh, a protein synthetic response is triggered and our muscles use the amino acids to build our muscles back up. Um, so satellite cells in our muscles are activated and begin to carry out this process. Uh, what we get is an increase in muscular cross-sectional area, so hypertrophy, um, which increases the capacity for the muscle to create forceful contractions. Um, so at rest, the muscle can get bigger and stronger. Um, and so that capacity is increasing the capacity for force development potential. Um, so why do we want to increase force development potential as athletes? Um, other than the general population benefits for strength um, that we can see here, um, all this is well and good and should be incentive enough um, for considering taking up strength training seriously. But from a sporting point, it's crucial. So as athletes, we want to be able to do more on the field and it's our muscles that can facilitate that movement. We'll look into the specific benefits of strength training over other types of uh, fitness for Quidditch more closely later. But it's important to understand that muscle tissues with an increased capacity to produce uh, powerful contractions will be able to exert more force whether that's with the limbs against the floor, or against gravity, against an oncoming opponent or, or an object, they'll be able to brace more strongly and will be able to cause the limbs to move more quickly or apply more acceleration to projectiles. So that could be a, a bludger. Um, as an additional benefit, uh, motor neuron pathways are also developed through practicing strength training. So this is the increase in speed in which electric impulses from the brain reach your muscles. So uh, how quickly your brain can talk to the rest of your body. Um, so when we look at the performance aspects uh, we want to improve for an athlete, and particularly Quidditch, it can be helpful to break down the fundamental actions and look at the ways that we can develop them through strength training. Um, in general terms, we're looking to develop the body's ability to run, throw, jump and tackle. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to show that resistance training can improve these sport uh, performance aspects and we'll talk uh, more specifically about those examples next. Um, what we can also include is diving and grappling in relation to seeking and snitch running and we'll look specifically at uh, practical uh, advice in the next section. And what I want to do in this next section is uh, firstly look at some of the transferable skills that we 
take the for Quidditch from other sports and see how those professionals develop their skills, um, i.e. see if all of these other sports take um, strength training seriously, and if so, do we as Quidditch players need to? Um, and then secondly, I want to try to pick up uh, any tips and tricks that we can take from uh, other sports and use them for ourselves. Uh, so I'm going to touch on a few key points from different sports and then look specifically uh, at how much consideration we should take for our sport. Um, so starting with handball, which I think is uh, a great deal of carryover, um, particularly for overarm throws and shots. Um, so what's interesting in this first piece is in handball, um, with a radar gun, they were able to correlate throwing velocity with upper body strength uh, from medicine ball throws and bench press one rep maxes. Um, and they were even more uh, highly correlated than um, genetic handball specific metrics like having uh, a big arm span or, or hand size. Um, and then the next point here is um, a reflection of, of where I think we'll see Quidditch in the future. Uh, so researchers compared high level handball players, uh, this was the Spanish national team, uh, with amateurs to compare whether fitness and anthropometric characteristics were the same. Um, again, the differenti differentiating factors between uh, subject groups were these strength and power variables rather than height or percentage body fat. Um, and I think that if Quidditch decides to back the camp uh, wanting to increase legitimization in the sport, then we'll see a greater push from all levels to invest in um, developing their physical capabilities. Um, so for basketball, um, a directly transferable finding we can take in this first example looked at what methods could be used to increase passing ability in basketball. Um, in this study, the, the bench press came out as the clear winner. Um, and this also looks into a more general point, which we'll touch on later. And that's whether high intensity, so meaning heavier, over 80% um, capacity. Uh, so whether high intensity training is best to elicit these uh, physiological training increases uh, versus light weight. Um, and if we remember back, we know we need to face a sufficient stimulus to improve. Um, and then in this next piece, uh, as, as a suggestion for people wanting to increase their vertical jumping ability, we can look at recommendations from basketball and look to include plyometric exercises. So those would be movements such as squat jumps or depth jumps. Um, and we can talk a bit more about plyometrics in the second part of the webinar. Um, so for netball, um, a review out of the UK a few years ago uh, very clearly highlighted the need for netball players to engage in strength training and anaerobic exercise in addition to normal training um, so that they could be more appropriately equipped for the actual physiological demands of matches rather than just the training environment. Um, they outlined potential strength training programming with exercises like squats and deadlifts and shrugs. Um, all with the aim of improving sprints and jumps and what's for, referred to as uh, first to the ball actions. Um, and then in keeping with the basketball result, we can see again um, in the Cronin study, um, the recommendations for developing passing ability for netball um, is linked to uh, the bench press and also increasing general strength. Um, and they were able to use bench press ability as a predictor for uh, passing distance. Um, so I'd like to highlight this piece as it speaks to the question that I'm really trying to open up with this webinar. Um, they looked at comparing physical strength characteristics with in-game performance metrics. Um, so that would be like turnovers and offloads and carries over the game line. And they compared the two to look at the relationship for what actually matters. So objective performance on pitch um, the players were from an international rugby union squad. Um, it wasn't stated, but uh, my guess is that it's the, the Wales team, as the researchers were from Swansea. Um, and unsurprisingly, they were able to show a positive correlation between these physical measures and match performance. Um, I've gone for this next one because it looks at what we'll be discussing next for Quidditch. Um, so Rudy the researcher here, uh, tracked and calculated the energy profiles of players in rugby league um, 
that means finding out how much of on pitch activity is explosive or anaerobic compared to more endurance based so cardio reliant or aerobic activity um to do this he recorded every action that a player did and ca categorized it um so this is very useful because uh, with this information we understand what the physiological demands actually are in a match and then we can align training practices to this uh, and make sure that players are appropriately prepared um, as you can imagine the finding was that rugby is a high intensity interval type sport and uh, suggests that fatiguing activities such as uh, 400 meter distance um, wouldn't be valuable and uh, rather spending more time training for ATP or explosive uh, energy system work. Um, the first tips come not only uh, with the wrestling but um, for judo and jiu-jitsu as well. Um, so they're sports which will require great displays of physical strength in order for athletes to be successful and the moves and stability needed can transfer quite well to both seekers and, and snitch runners as well as generally uh, for players in the seeker floor. Um, the training recommendations from this piece suggest uh, Olympic and power lifts like cleans and snatches as well as basic strength lifts like squats and shoulder presses. Um, they also recommend a frequency of around three to four times a week. Um, and then next up, aside from the standard barbell lifts for increasing power, such as the Olympic lifts, um, as a consideration for coaches designing wrestling specific training programs, it was suggested uh, to implement deadlifts without straps into training to develop grip strength, um, which I thought was an interesting recommendation, because um, even with the quite common struggles of Quidditch players um, that they seem to face with grip issues, wrestling arguably has a, a greater sport specific reliance on having a strong grip. Um, so this piece is also useful in general as it outlines the anaerobic energy profiles recorded in wrestling, which are similar to those of Quidditch. Um, and we'll look at that more in detail in a minute. Uh, finally, from this article, um, another unique perspective that we can take uh, from wrestling is the, the massive involvement of the neck and shoulders uh, regarding impacts. So from an injury prevention, prevention standpoint, they recommend the overhead press and shrugs. Um, and it's something that I'd never really thought about before. I read that last year. Um, so looking at football now, um, not soccer, um, there were some quite generalized results coming out of Norway. Um, they examined Rosenberg FC, who are the, the most successful Norwegian team ever. Um, they examined measurements for maximal, maximal strength against tests for things such as sprinting and jumping performance to find that um, there was a positive correlation. Um, and as they rightly put it, this is a, a logical conclusion which comes down to basic physics, meaning that if you're able to increase force and mass stays the same, then you'll see an increase in acceleration. And whether that's you accelerating your own body or applying acceleration to an object uh, like a quaffle. And also what we can see again in this next piece um, is that players with generally higher levels of strength are more successful um, by virtue of them being in the upper levels of, of the sports that they play. Um, so for baseball, first, we have a, a standard uh, test control study uh, showing that players who engaged in upper body strength training, um, the test group followed a, a program of bench presses and, and shoulder rotations. Um, so they had significantly higher throwing velocities than the control group who didn't strength train. Uh, what we also see is the importance of rotational strength being highlighted. Uh, now, this isn't something I have time to go into today, but uh, rotational strength plays an enormous role in throwing ability. Uh, being able to transfer that force that emanates from the big lower body muscle groups up through the midriff and to the arm ultimately falls on the torso. And um, if you can bridge that gap with the lats and, and the core rotational trunk muscles, um, your overarm throw it will greatly benefit the uh, Back to Hoops podcast had a very good analysis on, on the overarm throw. Um, and this is what we see in, in the bio, biomechanics of pitchers and also quarterbacks and, and handball players as well. Um, the next justification comes directly from the coaches. Um, 
It's interesting because Major League Baseball strength and conditioning coaches were asked what they do to train their players. Uh, when it came to strength and power development, they were asked to reveal the, the order of importance for resistance exercises in their programs, and the squat came out on top. Um, I think this ties in again to the idea that the transfer of force uh, through what's commonly referred to as the kinetic chain is so vital to get that power from the lower body um, to the arm. Uh, I'd really like to do a detailed piece on the biomechanics of uh, each of the, the movements in Quidditch uh, one day. Um, so, yeah, for sprinting, resistance training is a staple part of the overall training for sprinters and other track athletes. And uh, we can see that the squat and deadlift play a significant role in that. We know that there's some evidence to link one rep max uh, back squats to sprint speed, um, which was also the conclusion here uh, from Poland. Um, but looking at Usain here, although he incorporated a lot of barbell work into his training, um, I don't expect that his absolute figures would blow anybody away. Um, he's obviously a, a once in a lifetime athlete, but generally Quidditch players can learn some practical things from uh, elite runners. So um, we all have a general interest in being able to sprint, um, which we'll, we'll look at later, but especially depending on how the new rulebook changes are implemented, um, that initial period of acceleration is also of interest uh, for players during the um, brooms up portion on, on pitch. So in terms of practical tips, um, we can see from the study here, which assessed groups of Olympic and world championship uh, sprinters, that implementing barbell hip thrusts into training could have a, a positive effect on those first 10 meters in a sprint. Um, so that's emanating from the need to have strong glute muscles. Um, it's, it's not all for Instagram. And then aside from acceleration, we can look to implement uh, weighted jumps and heavy slow barbell squats for increasing maximum velocity after that. Uh, what we can take from badminton is the requirement for their athletes to have very uh, rapid rates of force development. So this is how quickly you can demonstrate those concentric contractions. Um, so that could be uh, in intimate seeker play or, or trying to just get to a loose ball. Um, that development here is stated as activity with uh, moving with a, a rapid intent. Uh, so, and also between 85 and 90% of uh, one rep max. Um, in the program they've created for elite players, they suggest the use of lunges and the bench press and squats. Um, and then next, looking at agility and quickness. Um, I just want to quote directly from this today, um, one second. So, namely, um, the agility requires muscle power in order to move quickly and technique in order to move efficiently. So as is true for badminton players here as uh, for Quidditch players, uh, we can improve our technical ability through drills and scrimmages. Um, and in order to translate that positively in game settings, we can train ourselves to manifest more power. Um, in this particular case, we can take away uh, developing hip extension and plantar flexion for working on agility. Uh, so from a, a lifting perspective, we know that that means something like a, a good morning or a back extension. And then for plantar flexion, uh, which is just planting your toes into the ground. Um, so movements like a, a calf race uh, would be beneficial here. Um, I'm quite disappointed that I wasn't able to find um, any evidence or quantitative uh, literature in general for dodgeball. Um, is it could be extremely useful for us, but um, so if anybody has looked into this, please do get in touch. Um, I'd say from what we've already uh, seen um, from studies, we can apply a, a lot of the interventions for increasing throwing velocity uh, and also agility. Um, but yeah, I, I'd love to get more into that another time. Um, and then. Uh, finally, here we have uh, the same re researcher as in the uh, Major League Baseball slide, who again look to uh, football coaches directly uh, to see how they train their athletes. And um, interestingly, they, they carried out physical tests on their players about four times a year. Um, on average, they did around 10 minutes of flexibility development a session. Um, and similar to wrestling training, 
uh, we see that the athletes are made to do three to four strength training sessions a week um, and that the squat was the highest priority lift um, and plyometrics were also used unanimously. Um, and then to finish off, um, one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in um, outside of personal development is the attitudes and practices of coaches. Um, and so there's a study which looked at performances in the NFL combine and successful players in the draft. Um, so over an 11 year span, it showed the increasing importance that these uh, franchise draft decision makers were placing on these explosive capabilities, uh, which weren't dependent on athletes being taller or, or heavy in recent years, um, which I also think is a, a nice segue into talking about how much importance should we uh, really put on this for Quidditch. Um, so why should we apply all this for Quidditch? Um, as you can imagine, there hasn't been much analysis done for Quidditch from a, a physical perspective. One day, I hope that will change. Uh, for the time being, I'd like to look at a rudimentary piece uh, that I shared in the Quidditch Europe group a while ago. Um, so the larger question I wanted to answer was, what is the most appropriate way to train as a Quidditch player? Uh, I wanted to compare what I'd commonly seen as an emphasis on the benefits of cardio and aerobic drills and training um, against the general lack of emphasis on explosive and anaerobic um, strength training, which uh, plays such a vital role in most of the sports. Um, so to do this, I tried to find out what actually goes on during a game of Quidditch so that um, that could be used as, as a guideline to prepare players for matches. Um, I took footage from the last European Games final between France and Belgium and tried to conduct what's called a, uh, a time motion analysis to look at the energy profiles for each position. Uh, what that means is tracking a player second by second to see if they were carrying out an explosive movement, so like a, a tackle or throwing a bludger or a sprint um, versus low intensity movements so like jogging or, or walking. Uh, from this, you can see how much work or rest um, is carried out by each player, and you can align that to different energy systems and methods of training. Um, while this was quite a, a basic analysis, I have to say um, the results indicated that Quidditch is fundamentally a game which requires intermittent bursts of high intensity and um, explosive interventions, which uh, have very little requirement for extensive cardiovascular activity. Um, and that's without taking into account stoppages and the ability to roll subs, um, which to me makes sense when you think of any of the important actions in a game. Uh, looking back at the previous physical development quadrants that we talked about, um, while having a good baseline level of cardio is important for any physical activity, uh, I would reiterate the need for all players to incorporate some strength and power-based uh, workouts into training, um, because on pitch, that's what we see are the uh, game actions. Uh, we know from uh, from the science that a barbell can make you throw harder and run faster and jump higher and um, be a better tackler in other sports. Um, and the same will be the same, the same in Quidditch, I would imagine. Uh, in the next section, I'm going to break down how you can go about introducing strength training sessions uh, into your own training. Um, so how do we practically implement strength work into our training? Um, there are a lot of people that ask for advice because <clears throat> they don't know what to do, or maybe they've started but have plateaued. Um, and the answer is to have a plan. Um, when they're talking about struggling into the gym and choosing the nearest piece of equipment that's free or picking an arbitrary number of star jumps to do at home. As with anything in life, you need to have a sustainable strategy if you want to achieve a long-term goal. Um, and we'll talk about what that looks like, um, or we're going to talk about periodization. Um, so a lifter called uh, Dr. Mike Isratel had a, a really good analogy for describing periodization, which is that plan we're talking about. So it's the roadmap we can develop to help us achieve the outcomes we're looking for. He said that periodization is like finding the best way to walk from Brooklyn to New York. I'm not sure why, why you'd want to do that, but um, sorry, not to New York, to New Jersey. Um, 
So now is is this the best way to go that we can see here? Or is that uh, just somebody taking a guess? Uh, could you make it there if you didn't have a map? You probably eventually could, um, but you could also get lost and give up. Uh, you could waste hours upon hours. You could end up in the middle of Manhattan in rush hour. Uh, you could be drawn out to the Empire State Building because it's big and, and shiny, or you could fall in the Hudson. Um, so having a solid plan will get you there in the most effective way, whilst also avoiding common pitfalls. Uh, so periodization generally is a way that we can plan training to adapt from what we did yesterday in order to be able to attain something new tomorrow. Um, we do this by managing underlying fatigue and sustainably manipulating training variables. Um, there are many ways to do this and the principles used in cycling, for example, will be different to those used for training for a marathon. Um, we're going to look at the most common methodologies for strength training now. Um, we've already spoken about the core principle behind progressing. If we cast our minds back to Milo, we have the blueprint for progressive overload that is providing an incremental increase to a previous stress. Um, that stress doesn't have to be weight, it can be the number of reps, it can be the speed at which you move a load, a range of motion, exercise variation, it can also be the manipulation of uh, minutes on your jog or miles. Um, anything that can bring about the stress recovery adaptation process that we spoke about earlier um, and lead to better results in the future. Um, and we can call this linear progression. Um, a little off topic, but I've included a link um, in the sheet to a talk by uh, somebody called James Clear, who's an author and has shared a 1% better theory around developing positive habits. Um, in essence, uh, this is again the simple idea of making incremental increases in a targeted and sustainable fashion um, to achieve a long-term goal, um, and it's well worth a listen. Uh, the important thing to remember is that we need sufficient stress to cause that adaptation. For strength training, that's why using free weights uh, has been shown to be so effective. Um, so don't be afraid of, of that gym. Um, but yeah, after a while, the variables with which you can manipulate body weight exercises or, or lightweight exercises can lead to plateaus and a, a lack of adaptive stress. Um, that's not to say you can't make changes through sit-ups, for example. Um, and we'll talk more about this at the end. Uh, so again, um, we're aiming for this to be able to develop a systematic route to get to a specific goal. Um, and we'll now talk about a specific methodology, um, which is particularly useful for athletes. Um, so the most common example of periodization in modern strength training is block periodization or phase potentiation. And that what that basically means is developing different characteristics at different times in order to arrive at a peak performance point. Uh, for some sports, it may be generalized to warm weather training versus competition training or off season versus on season um, hill training, altitude training, um, what have you. And we can break it down here. Um, we start with a, an overall time period called a, a macro cycle and everything within this cycle will be leading towards a specific target. Um, this may be over the course of a season or a few months leading up to a race or a tournament. Um, we have a target in sight and uh, that way we can manipulate our training to make sure that we're at our best at that time. So not three weeks before or three weeks after the, a competition. Um, we do this by developing a series of complementary training blocks, each with a specific purpose. So these blocks are called mesocycles and we can have uh, an example here. So. Um, each music cycle will have a specific focus. Uh, the example we have here is one with a, a huge amount of scientific backing for athletic performance and strength, um, but you can customize these for whatever outcome you're looking for. So in this example, let's say we specifically wanted to develop um, shoulder strength um, uh, and develop a, a stronger overhead press. Um, here in the first music cycle, we could dedicate a number of weeks to building muscular endurance, and that is focusing on hypertrophic training. So lots of reps, less emphasis on, on lifting heavy, but targeting an increase in muscle cross-sectional area, um, and therefore a greater capacity for strength development. 
and then so in this this second um, block um, would now be working to make use of that capacity um, that we've previously built up. Um, so we're looking to increase our overhead press. So now that we've built up a more solid muscular base, we'd start to increase uh, weight and reduce volume. Uh, we're increasing the specificity of training to align with um, what we're aiming for at the finish line. So strength increases here can come about um, by our neural pathways starting to become more efficient, uh, moving heavier weight, the contra contractile tissues in the muscle become more powerful, um, and we're able to continually lift heavier weights. The fi final block uh, would be the final stage of increasing specificity. So we've built up the force development capacity of the muscles, uh, we've made them stronger, and then we focus more on execution. So training as closely as possible to this final um, here overhead press target, um, but this could be um, sprint speed or, or whatever you, you like. Um, uh, you could call this uh, peaking, you could call it a, a competition preparation phase or what have you. Um, all of the different blocks complement each other in order to reach a singular endpoint. And this progression is developed at the micro cycle level. So each of these little blocks would represent a week of training or a day of training, um, exercises and weights and repetition schemes. All the variables that we talked about in the last slide will differ and follow one from each other um, so that the work in the micro cycles at the start of the meso cycle can lead to the outcome at the end of the, the meso cycle and the end of the training period as a whole. Again, this is uh, the most widespread type of uh, programming, uh, block periodization uh, for athletes with a target in mind, um, whether it's strength or fitness related, um, but there are many ways to, to skin a cat. So we can break this um, and another example down um, to see what that means on, a, on an everyday level. Um, so the general theme behind um, that overhead press example um, can be seen here. So across the MISA cycle, um, the sessions were geared to follow this general outline. The weights gradually uh, increase, that's intensity, um, and the volume gradually decreases. And uh, that's the cumulative number of, of reps and sets. Uh, this is a, a very basic model for managing uh, fatigue. I, you wouldn't try to lift as heavy as you could <clears throat> for lots of reps or in a, a half marathon um, every day for six days in a week. Um, conversely, you're not going to try to reach an effective adaptive dose um, by lifting light weights for a single rep. Um, as we said, uh, there are other ways to approach periodization. Another model we can look at is undulating periodization. And here we have an example of DUP, daily undulating periodization. Um, this model is, is most commonly used by people who want to train multiple characteristics simultaneously. Um, so rather than in sequence like we looked at, um, bodybuilders, for example, may want to train a muscle group or specific muscles multiple times a week. And by varying the exercises used um, to activate each of the heads of the muscles, they're able to work with very high overall volume and frequency while managing fatigue. Um, if we look at the example we have here, instead of bench pressing three times a week, this person would aim to elicit similar stresses on the body by varying the approach of uh, each exercise, usually with manipulating a heavy workout with a lighter volume workout and then with a dynamic effort workout. Um, so in this example, the numbers are just for presentation purposes, but we can see that this person has a, a light military press on Monday and a heavy day on Friday. Um, so they're able to keep up a high level of work by reducing or increasing the work of the rest of the workout uh, while hitting the same muscle group. Um, we can also see that this still follows the linear progression model um, with an increase of uh, three kilos from week one to uh, week two on each of the exercises, even though the dumbbell bench, for example, decreases in intensity from Monday to Friday. Um, now, in reality, a, a high level bodybuilder would likely have a frequency of five or six days a week for muscle group, but um, there is some supporting evidence uh, for the benefits of the style of programming. 
the takeaway point here is always to be cognizant of the plant and um, whatever it may be so nobody expects you to be able to um to go out and develop your own training uh, programs people have coaches and there are lots of readily available programs and training plans that you can find for free i'll point you to some solid ones in a minute um but the key is always to question what you're doing and whether it will lead to the objective you're aiming for so is, is that plan that that random guy in the gym gave you going to effectively manage your recovery or does the program you find found on a forum uh, look like it has realistic steps to get you from A to B. So having a general understanding of the theory behind programming um, will help you to reduce plateaus and you won't burn yourself out and you won't get uh, trapped in, in Times Square. Um, <clears throat> so we know we don't want to max out every session. Um, we've decided that we need a plan. Uh, so what kind of things should an athlete look to incorporate into that program? Um, and what general considerations should they take on board? Um, so as athletes, uh, we're looking to work the primary movers, the large, powerful muscle groups, um, because that's uh, what we're going to improve our performance on pitch with. Um, it wouldn't be time effective or beneficial from a, a sporting standpoint to focus on developing um, one of the three heads of the tricep, for example. Um, we engage multiple muscle groups and muscles that are at large contributors to the actions that we that will be reflected on pitch. So for this reason, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the core compound movements, which make up um, the most of core barbell training and attack lots of muscles at, at the same time. So uh, these exercises that between them cover pretty much every muscle in the body um, are the overhead press. Oh, Sorry, uh, the overhead press, uh, the squat, the bench press, and the deadlift. Um, these largely are the exercises that you see over again in, in the research that we've been uh, compiling today, um, but also what most professional strength coaches are, are prescribing in, in some capacity uh, for the sports we've referenced. Um, these lifts are, and some of the variations, which we'll uh, touch on later, are the co core compound lifts. Um, we're going to look briefly at how to do them, uh, how we can change them to open up new areas for exercise variation. And um, we're going to look at steps you can take to work up to them if you're struggling with your own technique. Um, just to note that these aren't the only exercises uh, you should include in your program uh, if you're designing one for yourself. Um, also, we'll touch on ways you can do resistance work without a gym or a barbell. Um, which might be quite useful for some, for some people at the moment. Um, before we move on, um, an additional exercise that is often classed as a core compound lift is the barbell row, we can see on, on the left. Um, we'll come back to this when we, when we uh, talk about deadlifting. Um, and then also um, here, I wanted to include um, core rotational moves, um, just because they're so beneficial for the uh, overall throwing actions that we have in Quidditch. Um, so it's important to include those as well. Um, and um, also you have the Olympic lifts, which are equally uh, good for recruiting multiple muscle groups. Um, these are much more technical and, and require a higher level of a skill acquisition, so you're unlikely to find them in a beginner program, but they're also great for dynamic training and building power. Um, so we're going to cover a few of the general principles that we should always keep in mind when we take on uh, these resistance exercises. Um, we'll look at specific form tips for each of the main lifts, but uh, before we do, here are some general overarching considerations for lifting. Uh, the first one is breathing. Um, it's important to time your breathing correctly and make sure that your breathing doesn't neg negatively affect how tight you can be um, and keep yourself under load. Uh, so we want to aim to fill our lungs and um, contract against uh, our core muscles and, and diaphragm in order to trap the air in uh, our body cavity and bracing and contracting the abdomen will help us do this. Uh, you should aim to take uh, that breath at the beginning of the lift after the weight is settled in the starting position. Um, once you're ready to start moving, you should make sure that you keep uh, that breath and stay tight. It can help to increase inter-abdominal pressure 
um, and that will help you lift. And um, you should hold that breath uh, for the eccentric portion of the lift. So that's um, when you descend in the squat and the, the bench and, and the overhead press. Um, and keep it there un until you're about to finish. That means holding tight for uh, most of the eccentric portion, um, which is the ascent or the explosive part. Um, so when you're about 80% of the way up from the top, I would say um, is when you can start to exhale if if you want to, if you need to, sorry. Um, the process uh, will, that will last about three seconds, but it can really help you get the most uh, from bracing. But also note that the deadlift starts with the concentric portion first. Um, and then next is bar path. So yeah, lifting is just all a question of physics. We're basically trying to move the weight from A to B. And we know that the most effective way to do that is in a straight line. Um, that way, as much of our energy as possible is used to move the bar where we want it to go. Um, and our form it, it improves uh, so that we expend less energy to try to adjust or compensate for misaligning or wobbling um, out of, of that, that line. Um, so we'll get a nice smooth lift and the bar will move efficiently from A to B along our desired bar path. Uh, you can think of bar path as a, an invisible line from the starting point of the movement to the finishing point. Um, for the most part, the way that we determine where the bar should align <clears throat> is over your center of gravity. Um, so if you're standing up, that's going to be uh, over the middle of your foot. Um, and that's the point at which uh, we're not going to rock forward or backwards um, if we have the bar on our back or, or over our head. Um, and consequently, we're not going to need to expend um, any energy to stop ourselves uh, tipping over. Um, if you can aim to keep a constant bar path in keeping with the, the center of gravity and the bar, um, then everything else will fall into place. Um, it will determine the angle of uh, your torso in the squat, um, it'll show you how to set up in the deadlift. It's a, a great um, takeaway point to remember. Um, so firstly, for the squat, um, take a, a grip width. Um, that's your outstretched arms in front of you. Um, and as you pull yourself under the bar, retract your, your scapula um, and place the bar on top of your, your traps. Um, your stance width should be about shoulder width apart and you want to balance your weight on the middle of your foot. So not to bring forward onto your toes or back onto your heels. Um, as we talked about, take a, a strong breath and brace by uh, just pretending someone is about to punch you hard in the stomach. Um, so then we want the hips and the knees to break at the same time as we descend. And that way we'll fall nicely into the hole at the bottom. Again, we need to try to follow that smooth uh, invisible bar path. Um, aim for a balanced and controlled descent in this first eccentric part of the lift when we go down. Um, we want to maintain the same back angle throughout the lift, so nice and neutral, and uh, focus on keeping our knees pointing in the same direction as our toes. Um, <clears throat> and then as we go down, uh, we want to aim for parallel when we get to the bottom, and that's when the top of the knee and the hip crease are both parallel to the floor. And from there, on the way up, you can focus on pushing your knees out, um, and that should make sure you don't have any any uh, inward knee valgus. Um, and then, oop, get ahead of myself. Um, and when we shoot up out of the hole, we want to aim um, our hips, aim for our hips and chest to rise up at the same time. Um, and that's when we complete the rep. Okay, a bit too eager. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, the overhead press is the easiest of the lifts. Uh, we want to grip the bar um, again at shoulder width. Um, our feet will be shoulder width apart again, and we're distributing our weight across the middle of the sole. What is that? Um, yeah, once again, we take a, a breath um, and brace the core tightly. Um, and then we drive upwards uh, with the arms, uh, making sure to keep a, a straight back. On the way up, we'll need to move the head back slightly so that the bar doesn't uh, contact our chin. But then once the bar passes the head, we can drive the head through uh, through that, that gap slowly um, to help with the rep. 
Um, and then finally, we can lower the bar down again slowly to the clavicle. Okay. Um, and then next, uh, we have the deadlift. So take a stance uh, around shoulder width apart. A good way to determine your stance width is to jump in the air as, as high as you can. And then when you land, you'll be in the position that your body naturally feels is most stable. Um, and then so next, place the bar over the middle of your foot, as we talked about. Um, at this point, um, you want to bring your shins to the bar, not the other way around. Um, we're going to brace again um, and reach down directly to the bar. You can just imagine that your arms are straight pieces of rope. Um, when you do this, you can retract and pull down your scapula. Um, as we reach down, um, we do this with a hinge uh, movement. So that is unlike the squat where we were uh, breaking at the knees and the hips at the same time. Here we primarily uh, are breaking with the hips and then we hinge our torso downwards, uh, keeping it straight the whole time. So your arms will fall down <clears throat> and that's where you take your grip. Uh, for beginners, I'd recommend a mixed grip uh, like we can see Johnny doing here. Um, so that's one palm, one palm facing forwards and the other facing back. Uh, this stops the bar rolling either forwards or backwards out of our hands. Um, and then before you start the lift, try to pull the slack out of the bar. So it's just a, a small adjustment that will mean your lift will be smoother and there'll be no slack in, in the entire system. And all that is, is pulling the bar to the top of the weight um, where that, that small gap is. Um, to start, you'll combine a, a powerful push through the floor with your legs and then maintain your torso angle until the bar reaches your knees. And then as the bar passes your knees, you'll bring your hips through and your body should stand up vertically um, in sequence. Um, and finally, uh, the bench. So start by lying on the bench and look directly up at the bar. Uh, reach up so that your arms are just outside of shoulder width. Um, depending on your equipment, you'll either slide or push the bar out um, to be resting aloft on top of your uh, above your body. Um, and then at this point, you'll retract your scapula, um, which will put you in a good position for the rest of the lift. So imagine there's a, a pencil between your shoulder blades um, and you're trying to squeeze it. Um, now we want to control the bar down to the chest. So bring your elbows in a little towards your torso, uh, which will make sure you're engaging the right muscles in the lift. And um, imagine you're trying to push a person away from you. You wouldn't flare your elbows up towards your shoulders. They'd be um, tucked in towards your torso. Um, then we're looking to make contact in the middle of the chest, um, as you can see in that image. Um, and then we're going to drive back up to the top. Uh, notice that when we spoke about bar path earlier for the bench, it's not going to be a straight upwards. It will angle um, up and back towards where we first started. Um, and so, yeah, there are many ways that we can manipulate these uh, like key ingredients or, or cords um, to cover all of the specific training variables that we're looking for. So some examples here, um, are the pauses, which will take away any momentum in the lift and forces to generate explosive power uh, from a dead stop. Um, we can increase or decrease the range of motion of a lift. Uh, for example, a deficit deadlift would call for us to stand on a, a raised platform or a plate so that we can start the lift from a lower position. Um, that can help us generate extra speed and power from the floor. Um, the tempo uh, reps here alter the speed at which we uh, do the lift and can increase time under tension. So in this video, the lifter descended for five seconds, uh, po paused in the hole for three, and then came back up quickly in about one second. Um, also, we can change the structure of the lift to target different heads of the muscles. So for example, we could do an incline bench, uh, which would bring about more engagement of the deltoids. Um, so we have to bear in mind that not everybody uh, will want to start implementing compound work straight away. Um, there are ways that we can build up progressions to these lifts. The first thing I'd say is if you can take advantage of a, a personal trainer, 
Um, many gyms offer free introductory sessions uh, when you sign up um, and you can be deliberate in asking to be shown uh, some form tips for uh, a front squat, for example, instead of having them show you how to sit on an ab crunch machine. Um, some people use a, a couple of sessions to be shown the form on some of these movements and then leave uh, leave the, the PTs to do some more structured uh, sport specific training. Um, aside from in-person assistance, uh, there are a number of ways which you can help yourself progress with little or no weight. Um, so bodyweight ex exercises are great for acclimatizing yourself to the ranges of motion and movement patterns of the main lifts. Um, and shopping bags are actually uh, great as well. Um, the, the way that the weight's distributed from the handle means that they're really useful for imitating all of these compound lifts. Um, you can drape bags filled with um, shoes over your shoulders and do squats. Uh, you can hold them up in your hands and do overhead presses. Um, yeah, so give them a chance if you're not afraid of looking a bit silly. Um, and then um, I'll also link uh, to these other progression exercises that can be very useful for working on um, specific lifts or slowly increasing ranges of motion um, that you're able to put load through. Um, so for example, Box, squat, box squats are fantastic for people who are working on um, how to reach proper depth in the squat. Um, and, and then block pulls are great for gradually increasing the range of motion of pulls uh, whilst still handling quite significant loads. Um, yeah, and then so next, uh, we know that uh, we have a good idea of the main compound exercises. Um, that form the basis of sports performance resistance programs. Uh, we know what we need to put in, um, but how do we actually plan out each session? Um, well, a quick analogy that I like to tell people is that a session is pretty much like a, a three course meal. Um, you have your starter, your main and your dessert. Um, they're laid out in a specific order and each plate has a different meal on it. Um, so as you can probably guess, the starter is the warm up. Um, this is a really important step, so don't mistake, um, don't make the mistake of glossing over your warm-ups. Uh, you'll be doing yourself a disservice in the long run, um, and possibly acutely as well. Um, so I've written an article specifically on uh, on this, which I've linked, but I'll also tell you here. Um, you should aim to include three components in your warm-up. Firstly, uh, you should actually warm up. Um, so you can choose an exercise of your choice that's going to raise your body temperature and uh, get blood flowing around your body and also make you get a little bit of a sweat on. Um, so a quick row or a cycle, um, the elliptical machine or, or the treadmill, wh whatever you prefer. Uh, this shouldn't be too long. Um, a bit of a sweat or a heavy breathing is enough. Um, we didn't come here for the starter. Uh, we're conserving our energy for the main. For example, I might do it a three or four minutes on a, on a static bike, um, but not a 20 minute 5K and expect to have a, a good squat session. Um, next up uh, should be a set of dynamic warm-up movements, i.e. stretches that will involve movement and will be relevant to the area that you intend to focus on when lifting. So you might want to choose mountain climbers ahead of a squat session. Um, you have a lot of flexibility here. Um, yeah, excuse the pun. And then finally, uh, you want to choose uh, a warm-up that will engage the muscles that uh, we'll use for the main exercise. But again, we're not looking to expend a lot of energy here. These exercises will be light. So ahead of a bench press session, you may want to do some very light reps um, on one of the pectic machines uh, in order to warm yourself up um, in the ranges of motion that you'll be using um, in your uh, main session. So then next up is the main meal. This is where we have the compound lift, uh, which will be the focus of, of the session. This is where we put in the work um, and how we'll primarily track progress in these sessions in, in the weeks to come. Um, again, we want to prepare ourselves properly, so don't dive straight into a heavy set. Uh, even the best international lifters will start sets with an empty bar. Um, and then yeah, take measured jumps in weight. Uh, and this is the same principle if you're not using a barbell. Uh, so we're going to dial in our form with each rep and try to improve technique every time we come to train. Uh, you should put as much focus into your first warm-up sets as you do with your top heaviest sets. 
um, your your rest time between compound sets should be around three to four minutes, which will likely give your body enough time to somewhat recover. Um, if you're still breathing heavily, or for example, um, then feel free to take an extra minute or two. For the compound lifts, our aim is to complete the sets well. So we should give ourselves enough time to do justice to the sets. Uh, we can focus on eliciting additional fatigue with shorter rest periods in the next meal. Um, so then onto dessert, uh, this is where we'll do our additional work to complement the main compound lift session. Um, so these exercises are commonly called assistance or accessory exercises. Um, as they're used to focus on areas for improvement um, for the heavier lifts uh, or provide a more targeted stimulus in addition to our full body exercises. Uh, we looked at a couple of them in, in the previous slides. Um, so this could be just to add balance to the workout or for general fitness or for aesthetics. Um, you'd expect to be using much lighter weight here, um, but we can elicit that sufficient adaptive stress through uh, much higher reps. Um, often to levels uh, at or close to muscular failure, as well as having an almost unlimited level of exercise variation. Uh, so for these exercises, as the goal is usually to bring about muscular fatigue, we can reduce the rest periods uh, between sets to around 90 seconds. Um, and personally, I'd end the session with uh, some more quick dynamic stretches. Um, and yeah, so next steps, um, well, the next step is, is just a start. Uh, anybody can add more strength work into their training and everybody can and will benefit. Um, I've used training in the gym as a lens for most of this information, but I appreciate that not everybody will be able to access uh, a barbell, especially given the current restrictions. Um, but that isn't the be, be all and end all of resistance training. You can apply this information, whether you have access to dumbbells or just a, a bag full of books. Um, we can still reach and manipulate uh, levels of sufficient adaptive stimulus. Um, people have just had to be more patient and creative. Um, throughout lockdown, you'll have likely seen uh, some form of Zoom class advertised offering hits or so that's high intensity interval training uh, so those workouts um, and there's good evidence backing the benefits of these type of workouts especially for power and plyometric improvements um, if we go back to another sports performance example um, plyometric exercises like jumps and bounds have had positive improvements in activities for agility and change of direction um, yeah, so in, in terms of these classes, uh, here are a couple of the best that I've been made aware of this year. Um, uh, so Alice Living is very popular. Um, she a very popular, high energy, kind of a, a typical Instagram fitness person, but definitely it gets you working. Um, and then we have Mariana uh, from MP Fitness, who is also uh, from the Quidditch community. Um, in the UK and also um, the Spanish national team um, and people love her service and she always puts out good information on, on social media so uh, check her content out um, and so if we head back to traditional programming uh, my recommendation for starting would be um, if you don't have a coach who can give you individualized programming then try to find a set program to follow um, there are lots of solid beginner and intermediate programs you can find for free. Uh, my recommendation for brand new lifters has always been uh, the Strong Lifts 5x5 five five program, as it's, a, a very, it's very simple and really gives you time to explore yourself and, and get, to, get a feel for the movements um, and your own preferences. So if, if we recap the common training methodologies again, 5x5, um, five five, this is a, a quintessential model of uh, linear periodization. It's simply adding 2.5 kilos or five pounds of freedom units um, to the previous session each time. Um, that's all it is. There's no additional science to it. You have a handful of basic exercises to carry out each session um, and you slowly increase your tolerance to weightlifting. It's a, a tried and tested uh, sandbox program. You'll eventually outrun the program um, or be ready to stop and move on to something more substantial. Um, I've shamelessly included the next two, um, as these are programs that I've developed. Uh, the first one, uh, PrEP10, is a more advanced beginner program than 5x5. 
Um, so looking back at the methodologies, it follows a, a, a block periodization model and it revolves around the, the compound lifts, but also has quite a lot of exercise variation. Um, and the next is prep quid, uh, which has been created specifically with Quidditch in mind. Um, it's simple to follow and has uh, been developed in line with the first half of the presentation. So uh, looking at transferable components from existing training programs in um, professional mainstream sports, real sports. Um, and um, I'll share a follow up soon, which looks specifically at this. Um, and then next is a, a tried and tested uh, beginner program called the Candito Linear Program, which specifically uh, um, looks again at a, a linear periodization model. Um, it has the same week setup repeated, um, but there's a, a good deal of exercise variation in the days in that one week. Um, so specifically, it's set to a, an upper lower body split with a, a different overall focus each day. Also, Johnny Candito uh, provides some of the best uh, strength training content on his YouTube channel, uh, so make sure to check him out. And then I've also included a link for liftvault.com, uh, which is a repository of uh, programs for all different levels, so feel free to check those out. Um, and with that, we've come to the end of the webinar. Um, I hope you found some useful information here. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Time is the most valuable thing we have, so thank you. Um, and I hope that we as a sport can start to think more seriously about incorporating strength work into our training um, as we're making great progress in all of the other frontiers. And, and I hope this leads to more conversations and learning. Um, this is an area that I'm really passionate about, so I'll happily talk all day about it. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to get in touch on Facebook or Instagram anytime. And uh, yeah, well, thank you again, and I will hopefully see you soon.